news and bad news, girls. The good news is your dates are here. What's the bad news? They're dead. I'm gonna take you to the bank. To the blood bank. Welcome, B-Movie Maniacs, to another episode of B-Movie Babylon, a safe space for trash cinema lovers where we believe the B and B movie stands for brilliant. I'm your host, Mike Bracken. Some of you might remember me as the Horror Geek from Comedy Central's old pop culture game show, Beat the Geeks, or my popular YouTube channel, The Horror Geek, where I host a show called Sick Flicks. Others of you may remember me as that dick on social media. <laughs> I'm really all of the above. No matter how you know me, thanks for being here as we stalk the forgotten corners of the video store in search of some of the greatest B-movies ever made. Whether you love martial arts mayhem, low-budget exploitation films, rip-offs of popular movies, or anything in between, we've got you covered on this show. When I first conceived this show, it was because there was a small list of movies I wanted to talk about that didn't fit in with my YouTube show, Sick Flicks. Today's movie is one of the movies that was on that original list. A martial arts flick that's so bonkers it could have only come from the 80s. That's right, we're talking about Jim Cotta. Jim Cotta shows why man shouldn't play God, by merging Olympic gymnastics with the most useless martial arts this side of Tai Chi or Aikido. <laughs> it's even more ridiculous than it sounds. So grab a cold one and settle in as I regale you with the tale of the movie that tried to turn Olympic gymnast Kurt Thomas into a modern-day half-assed Bruce Lee. By the time this one's over, you too will be a master of Jim Cotta. But first, a little bit of my history with this cult classic film. As a kid born in the early 1970s, I was around for a lot of cool technological advances, like the advent of the VCR and the rise of cable television. I will forever argue that being born a Gen Xer was one of the best things to happen to fledgling film nerds. But even more importantly than that, if you came of age in the 80s, you were at ground zero for the advent of the VCR, maybe one of the most important technological innovations of the 20th century. I can't really understate how important the arrival of the VCR was. It was like a seismic impact in the home entertainment market. Finally, we had access to movies we could watch whenever we wanted and rewind them, rewatch them, fast forward through the boring parts and whatever. Plus, we could record television and uh, skip commercials and... It was just a complete game changer for how we viewed television and interacted with film. Sure, it feels quaint and outdated by today's standards of HD DVD and Blu-ray and 4K and UHD and LED and all these crazy acronyms, but during the first Reagan administration, this thing was like a magic box. I first saw a VCR at my dad's cousin Kenny's house in Pittsburgh when I must have been like eight. It had to be like 1981 or 82. So we show up at Kenny's house one night as a kid. We're in Pittsburgh. We're visiting my grandparents, my, my father's parents. And, uh, and we always swing by Kenny's place to kind of say hi and hang out for a little bit. And Kenny, we get in and he's like, you have to see this, this technological marvel I have acquired. And we go into his entertainment room and uh, he's got a big TV. And hooked up to the TV is this gigantic rectangular box and uh, this was a VCR, and this was a top loader VCR that probably weighed like 100 pounds back in the first generation of VCRs. If, you, if you've if you ever gone back and looked at how VCRs evolved in terms of appearance and design and features and things like that, the earliest ones were kind of like gigantic uh, tape decks, basically. Uh, they had kind of the same kind of buttons and everything like that, and they were just enormous and heavy, and a lot of them had like weird wood grain on them. What's our fascination with wood grain in the 80s? Anyway, so Kenny is like, this is VCR. We didn't really know what that was, but he's like, here, I've got this tape and I'm going to put it in. And he puts it in and it's John Wayne's Hondo. And uh, I don't have any particular interest in John Wayne movies at eight years old. However, I'm like, okay, so we've got this movie and he's got it on and it's playing. And I'm like, well, this is like watching TV. And then we watch a scene and he's like, oh, did you like that scene? And we're like, yeah, that was a cool scene. And he's like, well, hold on. And so he hits the button and rewinds it and it goes back and he watches the scene again. And uh, to eight year old me, this was like magic. This was like science fiction made real. Like we talked for years about like, oh, what if you had something where you could record TV and you could stop it and pause it and play it and rewind it? And uh, here it was. And this was my first experience with a VCR. And it was just absolutely mind-blowing to eight-year-old me because I'm that much of a nerd, right? The thing about these early VCRs was that they were new technology. And like all new technology, they were super expensive. And uh, I, I guarantee you that Kenny had was an early adopter, of course, and had dropped at least a grand, maybe two grand on this VCR, which in like $1982 was just a shit ton of money, right? But I am transfixed by this. I My eight-year-old brain can see how the VCR 
is going to have an impact on everyone's life. And as like a guy who liked TV, even at that young age and movies and things like that, this was like the coolest thing ever. So we leave Kenny's house and we're all kind of blown away by this, this VCR as I, as I remember it. And, uh, and I'm like, we need a VCR. And my dad, God bless him, was a carpenter in the steel mill. And uh, he did very well, like working in the steel mill back in the day. It was a really great job. You were in the union. You got paid a lot. You got overtime. But there was no way my dad was shelling out two grand for this box to record TV and watch movies on. So uh, I didn't even broach the subject with him, right? I'm just like, oh, I really want one of these things someday. But, you know, we're never going to get one. However, as the 80s marched on, the VCR became more ubiquitous, and with it came the rise of video rental stores, so if you didn't want to shell out like two grand for a VCR, or a thousand dollars, or even eight hundred dollars, is what they were back in those days, um, you could go to these video rental stores, and you could not only rent movies there, but you could actually rent a VCR for the weekend, or for a couple days, and some movies, and bring it home, and try it out, and enjoy the experience of watching uncut feature-length films in your own home. Uh, however you wanted to, whenever you wanted to, rewind them, watch them as much as you want. And uh, my parents were big on renting VCRs. We weren't going to buy one, but they would absolutely rent one. So it was like one night that year in the middle of winter that my parents came home um, after we'd come home from school and they had gone out and they show up at the door and they've got this bag of stuff and this big giant plastic looks like a suitcase basically. And I'm like, what is this? And sure enough, they had rented a VCR and they had rented some movies to go along with that VCR. So we were going to have a movie weekend with this fancy VCR hooked up to our gigantic 27 inch console TV, which was, you know, like 27 inch TVs were real baller back in the, back in the early eighties. Uh, now nobody even makes them but but uh yeah so we were gonna rent it and we were gonna have this movie weekend with this thing the first movie i ever saw the first movies i ever actually saw on vcr were uh disney's weird the black hole and uh toby hooper's poltergeist so uh they came home with those that weekend and i was as happy as a pig in shit basically so it's worth pointing out here that if you're younger than me and you probably are and didn't grow up in the 80s that the 80s were a really different time the world was cool, but it moved much slower than it does today. Uh, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have all these things that people use now to distract themselves with and, and use to entertain themselves in all their free time. Being a kid in the 80s, a Gen Xer, was uh, long periods of boredom punctuated by moments of slightly less boredom. <laughs> That's probably the best way I can describe it. So the key takeaway here is that the 80s were definitely a slower time and kids did not have as many options to entertain themselves. So we made our own fun and we did things like watch stupid TV shows that we had no interest in because that was the only thing that was on or we reread books for the 150th time because you hadn't had a new book fair and nobody got you new books. Or uh, we'd make paper airplanes <laughs> and try to fly them off the top of the house and uh, just all kinds of crazy stuff. But for me, one of my favorite things to kill at least an hour every week was reading the TV guide. And like, how amazing does that sound, right? You kids probably don't even remember TV guides. So anyway, we'd get this TV guide every week, right? And I would save it. I would not necessarily read it on Sunday. Sometimes I would if it was a slow Sunday. But I like to kind of save TV guide from the paper, especially in the summer, to like Monday or Tuesday because we were home from school and you were going to have to kill a whole day. And uh, if you killed it on Sunday, something interesting might be going on. But, it, it, you know, and so you would not have anything to read on the slow days when your parents were at work. But um, if you if you saved it till like Monday or Tuesday, you were guaranteed like an hour of entertainment flipping through the TV guide to see what was coming on that week. You didn't want to wait too long because if you waited till like Wednesday or Thursday, I'll, you'd missed a bunch of stuff. But, but if you got on it on like Monday... Uh, you were okay. And so I would get this thing every Monday and take it out of the stack and try to kill some time. And I would literally pour over the TV guide like it was a sacred text. Uh, I would read. It was just this window into this world of sort of wonderful, weird shows with these pithy descriptions. And and you never really knew what you were getting. And then they, you know, they would have the big ads for stuff coming on and stuff like that. But uh, it was just this weird way to kind of learn about movies and shows that you didn't have access to in the time before the internet. You couldn't just go to IMDb and look up actors or movies or kinds of movies and then get suggestions or any of that. You just had to look in the TV guide and what was coming on was what was coming on and maybe something was interesting to you and you would remember to watch it. So for me, the TV guide was like 
this big deal. And, and my attitude towards the TV guide was the same as my attitude towards films. Now I would read through the TV guide and it would have all these descriptions of like popular films that were going to be on that week, whatever. And, uh, and they would often rate them with little star ratings, like one to five. And, and so anything that got a five, I was absolutely not interested in because that was like something that was good for grown ups type thing or serious people. Uh, but I loved going through and finding all the stuff that TV guy was like, oh, this is a two star or a one star, like a one star was gold. Like if you found a one star movie, you're like, oh, I need to see that. Right. So, um, yeah. So we spent a lot of time like planning our entertainment this way because, again, nobody had VCR. So you had to catch stuff when it was on. And if you missed it, you missed it. And it might not be on again unless you had cable, which we didn't. And when the VCR came along, we entered a whole new world of viewing opportunities because we could watch what we wanted when we wanted as long as it was available to rent on video and somebody would take you to the video store to get it or if you had taped it off TV and then had time to watch it later. So this opened up a whole new world of movies for me. But unfortunately, you know, you couldn't rent a VCR every day. You might as well just buy one at that point. My dad wasn't buying one and we weren't renting one every day. Renting a VCR was like a special occasion. It was like getting taken to the Brown Derby. Uh, when my family said, hey, we're going to the Brown Derby in Youngstown, that was a big deal. And you knew it was like something big was going on because that's a fancy dinner for us. And uh, if you got there and my dad was like, yeah, the kids can have Virgin Shirley Temples, you knew it was a real special occasion. And that's kind of like what getting the VCR was like when we would rent one. It was like going to the Brown Derby and getting a Shirley Temple uh, with no alcohol, of course. And my dad getting CPS called on him. So we would rent movies pretty regularly, not every weekend, because, you know, the price of the machine, you had to put down a deposit that was often a couple hundred dollars because these were very expensive pieces of consumer electronics. And they were concerned you might not bring it back. Right. You know, they might abscond with their uh, you might abscond with their VCR and they're out like fifteen hundred bucks. So so it was not an every weekend type thing, but we did rent them often enough. And when you would go to the video store and rent movies, they had a bunch of movies because everything was kind of transitioning to coming out on this new format so that they the studios could make money off of it. Uh, but my favorite part of that, aside from renting the movies, was that every time you would go, you would get a new coming soon flyer or brochure from your video store. And this was every bit as good as the TV guide. In fact, it was maybe even better. Anyway, this is an interminably long story of mine. I'm sorry, um, like all my stories. Uh, so after renting Poltergeist in the Black Hole, we return them and we get what is the first of many video store coming soon brochures. These brochures were really interesting. They were not um, something printed by the store. They looked like they came from like some production company or studio or something like that, although they kind of covered everything that was coming out. I don't know who, who made them or at the time or anything like that, but they were... They were not just a sheet with movie titles and dates on them as they became later. They were like a full color thing and they had pictures of the, the box art and then a description of who was in it and what it was about and when it was coming in and, and all that kind of stuff. And man, I just took these things home and devoured them. Like I was like, here are all these cool movies. Some I've heard of, some I haven't. Uh, many that I want to see now because I know they exist. And, uh, and it was again, it was cooler than the, the TV guy because I didn't have to sift through a bunch of crappy TV shows. I could just see movies, which was what I was really interested in. The thing that really caught my eye, even more than my bloody Valentine, was a little film called Jim Cotta. The brochure had an image of the box on it, which basically had like this white clad gymnast dude in the air kicking two ninjas in the face and all but scream the tagline, all the skill of gymnastics and the kill of karate. I mean, how can I resist that? I mean, obviously, this immediately shot to the top of my must see list. But my parents, bless their hearts, do not share my love of trash cinema and horror movies. So there was no way in hell they were running me Jim Cotta. I mean, for my parents, renting a VCR was pretty much a luxury thing, and there was no way they were going to plunk down a couple hundred dollar deposit, even though they were getting it back, and the money to rent movies and the VCR, and then come home with shit like Jim Cotta. That was just not going to happen. My dad was like, no, we're renting Firefox, and you're going to like it, because by God, it's got Clint Eastwood in it. So, with my parents at dead end preventing me from seeing Jim Cotta, I went to my best source for all movies, Grandma. My grandmother loved all the same cheesy, shitty movies I love, and as such, she would just take me to the video store with the card and a credit card and just turn me loose. And uh, this was like the heart of my film education as a kid before I went to college. I would go spend those summers up there, and in, in the course of a couple years, I had been through the entire horror, action, and sci-fi section of like three different video stores. And I don't mean I had just been through and seen the stuff I wanted to see. 
I had literally rented every horror movie, every action movie, and every sci-fi movie in those stores. And one of the first things I rented, Jim Cotta. I'd love to tell you that Jim Cotta was like the Octagon or Revenge of the Ninja and totally lived up to the hype in my hormone-addled young adult brain, but that's not really true. Jim Cotta was definitely not what I envisioned in my head, and I'm not even sure what I imagined anymore, but it was <laughs> definitely not what we got. I mean, really, this story of a nebbish gymnast sent to a fictional country in Karabal on the Caspian Sea, as the film likes to remind you regularly for absolutely no reason whatsoever, was weirder even than I expected. But even though it didn't live up to what I envisioned in my head, young Mike knew that Jim Cotta was truly a terrible movie, in the best way possible. Simply put, Jim Cotta is a dumb movie, maybe one of the dumbest movies ever made. I mean, it stars a gymnast with no martial arts experience sent to a fictional country in the middle of nowhere to partake in a series of games that feel like a trial run for most extreme elimination challenge. He'll meet a love interest who's totally not even remotely interested in him, train a bunch of stuff that never turns up in the rest of the film, and then take off for a fictional country where he partakes in this game to save America. Characters will come and go with absolutely no rationale whatsoever. There's random gymnastic equipment wherever a fight breaks out, and the locals will stand there and let Thomas twirl around on the pommel horse like it's nobody's business instead of just rushing him as a group and taking him out once and for all. It's a movie where everything is literally an afterthought, and it feels like they made it up as they went. And goddamn, do I love it for that! So, here's some of the background information you should probably know before going into Gymkata. While training an Olympic gymnast in a fake martial art so that he can go to a fictional country to partake in a game where if he wins, he can help the USA get a leg up on the Russians sounds like something straight out of the 80s, it's actually not. Jim Cotta, as it turns out, was actually inspired by a book. Dan Tyler Moore's The Terrible Game was the actual blueprint for Jim Cotta, and it was published way back in the 1950s. Moore had a very interesting life even before writing The Terrible Game. He was an intelligence officer in World War II, then became a writer. His father, Dan Tyler Moore Sr., was an advisor to President Theodore Roosevelt. An avid boxer, the senior Moore was actually responsible for blinding Theodore Roosevelt in one eye during a sparring session. The Terrible Game was Moore Jr.'s only novel. But seriously, when you hit a home run in your first at bat, why even step up to the plate again? In his defense, he did also publish some nonfiction before his untimely passing in 1998. I have not actually read The Terrible Game, but by most accounts, it's pretty good and features a lot of things that turn up in Jim Cotta. Except the actual Jim Cotta. The book, like the film, features a young man sent off to a fictional country still mired in what seems like medieval times so that he can partake in a game where if he wins, he'll get the wish of his choice. I'm not gonna lie, this reminds me a lot of Highlander, which we'll be covering soon. As it turns out, Jim Cotta was not the first attempt to turn the terrible game into a film. There was a cinematic version planned in the 1960s with Rock Hudson cast as the lead character. <laughs> I'm guessing they didn't teach him how to do Jim Cotta. I mean, but sure, I do like to picture Rock Hudson flipping around kicking dudes in the face from a pommel horse. There are some differences between the book and the film. In the film, the US needs Kurt Thomas to win so that they can place a satellite in the country that will be part of their Star Wars defense initiative, which was an actual thing in the Reagan era 80s. In the book, he wants to win so that they can place an atomic howitzer there to keep the Russians in check instead. I have no idea what an atomic howitzer is, but suddenly I want one. I really have no idea how we got from the book to the film that is Jim Cotta, except to say that the 80s were a wild time in Hollywood and you could basically launch all kinds of projects with minimal studio involvement if you were so inclined. However, MGM did get involved with this one eventually and were responsible for distributing it. And for as odd a choice as it was to cast Kurt Thomas in the lead role in a martial arts film, they did at least hire the right director for the job, bringing in Robert Klaus. Klaus was no stranger to action cinema, having directed Bruce Lee in Enter the Dragon and Game of Death, Cynthia Rothrock in the China O'Brien films, Jackie Chan in The Big Brawl, and cult favorite Bolo Young's Ironheart. Anyway, with all of that crap out of the way, let's get into the actual movie and talk about why Jim Cotta is so amazing. The film doesn't waste any time getting started and opens with some gymnastics. It's a pretty bold choice. I mean, really, I'd have probably opened with a fight. From there, we hop over to Parmistan, where some ninjas are hunting the most dangerous game, a man in the greenest pants I've ever seen. And I don't mean green like camouflage, I mean green like Mr. Green Jeans pants on Captain Kangaroo. Probably doesn't help elude detection much. But it gets even worse because he's being chased by discount Luigi Montefiore and ninjas. 
I'm starting to feel like every action movie in the 80s incorporated ninjas somehow. Anyway, what I've gathered from these early scenes is that basically this movie was a test run for American Ninja Warrior, only when they finally got it out into production they removed all the killing parts and just kept the obstacle course. Anyway, these ninjas are master hunters and they do eventually knock off Mr. Green Jeans. He takes an arrow to the chest, which is the first of many arrow deaths in this movie. Seriously, there are a lot of bow and arrow deaths in this thing. Back in our other movie, Kurt Thomas is finishing his gymnastics routine and dismounts right into a freeze frame. It's pretty unusual. Usually you get the freeze frame at the end of the movie, not at the end of the first segment. And I have to stop and point out here that if you're watching this on video, we need to take a moment to appreciate the magnificence of Kurt Thomas's mullet. This thing is all business in the front and uneven parallel bars action in the back. I'm not gonna lie, Kurt gives off strong young Steve Irwin vibes here. Casting Thomas in the lead role was an odd choice, not just because he wasn't a martial artist, but because he was a really big time gymnast who was set to go to the Olympics in 1980 where they expected him to win some gold medals. Unfortunately for Kurt, the 1980 Olympics were set to be held in Moscow, and the U.S. boycotted them because Russia had invaded Afghanistan. Thomas could have waited another four years and competed in L.A. in 1984, where he would have still probably been a favorite to win a gold, but he decided he didn't want to do that. This is probably because he would have had to spend another four years maintaining his amateur status and not making any money, which really kind of sucks. In my downtime, I really like to think of Kurt Thomas circa 1986. I can just imagine him doing uneven parallel bars in his house and then flipping off of them into a pool filled with Jim Cotta money. I mean, really, it probably didn't happen, but don't ruin my illusion. As it turns out, not waiting for 1984 was probably a good choice. I mean, even if he'd won the gold medal in 84, he'd have been overshadowed by Mary Lou Retton, who'd have probably then gotten the lead role in this movie anyway. Or maybe they'd have given it to Mitch Gaylord. Sadly, Thomas passed away in 2020 at the way too young age of 64. He'd suffered a devastating stroke two weeks prior to his passing, and with his death, all hopes for a Jim Cotta 2 died with him. Anyway, now that Kurtz won the big gymnastic event, he's got some dude here trying to recruit him to one of the Alphabet Soup government agencies. Every time we get to this part of the movie, I find myself wondering if they'd still recruited him if he lost. I mean, I get it. My brain is weird. But you do have to wonder, was this really how the CIA was vetting spies and secret agents in the 80s? Were they just wandering around random gymnastic events, picking the winners and trying to recruit them into service? It's going to make your Olympic training look like finger painting. It turns out they want to send Kurt to Parmistan, a fictional country where the breadsticks are endless and your salad bowl never empties. Now, oh, and it's in the Hindu Kush range, so Kurt's totally going to pick up some edibles. We get a lot of exposition here about how they want to send him to this country so he can play this crazy game that no one actually knows how to play, and if he wins, the goal is to just get him to use his wish to put this missile defense system in there so that we can shoot down Russian nukes in case they ever fire them off. The catch here is that our evil Luigi Montefiore wannabe is actually cozying up to the commies, and he doesn't want that to happen. I mean, really, the conflicts of these 80s movies really did just right themselves. Fresh face American badass versus evil communist empire is basically every 80s trope in one. It was like a cottage film industry, pretty much. Also, Jim is sent to an imaginary country where he will partake in a weird game with no clear rules, and if he wins, he gets his greatest wish. Sounds like something I'd have made up in second grade. And yet, Kamer got big Hollywood screenwriting money for this. The world is a crazy place. As it turns out, I'm sure winning this thing is going to be super easy for a guy like Kurt. I mean, how hard could it be, right? No outsider has won the game in over 900 years. Hmm, well then. Oh, and just in case you were wondering, Mr. Green Jeans was totally Kurt's dad. I mean, that shit's so obvious, Ray Charles saw it coming like four miles away. But surely Kurt is not his father and will not make the same mistakes dear old dad made. And how do we know this? Because he's hanging out with the Parmistan Princess, who's going to teach him the ins and outs of the local culture and how to win the game. With their male lead cast, the production had to find a love interest for Thomas. They eventually decided on Filipino actress Techi Agbayani. Agbayani was just the right kind of exotic for this role, even though she looks absolutely nothing like her father the king or the people of his fictional land. That's just the kind of attention to detail you got in these early 80s action movies. Agbayani had an interesting career. She appeared in John Borman's The Emerald Forest, and after appearing in Jim Cotta, she had a bit part in The Money Pit. Beyond that, she worked as a Playboy Playmate and eventually took time off from acting to raise a daughter. But naturally, you can't just head to Parmistan and play the game, even if you have the princess teaching you the rules. 
No, you need to train first, which means we get a training montage. Apparently, this montage training just involves Kurt Thomas being able to handstand walk up a flight of stairs, which does not ever factor into the rest of this movie, unfortunately. But Tadashi Yamashita is one of Kurt's trainers, and he's going to teach him how to use Kama blindfolded, which also will never again appear in this movie. Yamashita is not only one of Kurt's trainers, but he also has this giant bird he keeps with him. I mean, that's what passes for character development here. We've got Tadashi Yamashita, and he's only going to be on screen for like five minutes, so how can we make him unforgettable? Oh, I've got it. Give him a giant bird. Yamashita had previously appeared in Chuck Norris's ninja flick The Octagon, which we'll probably cover at some point, and also turned up in American Ninja. It's one of those guys that you probably don't know his name, but you recognize him instantly when you see him. Unless you're a big B-movie dork, then you know his name and his face. And you're like me. But again, I love that this whole segment spends time teaching Kurt skills that he will never use again, like how to swing commas blindfolded, or how to handstand walk upstairs. With the training montage all over, his handler, who kind of looks like a discount Elliot Gould, is going to break down the film with a thesis statement. Oh, you know karate and your own special gymnastics. This would have been a great time to drop a title mention, but we never actually mentioned Jim Cotta by name in this movie talk about missed opportunities. I know, I'm as disappointed as you are. Then things get really goofy. I mean, if you want to know how stupid Jim Cotta is, look no further than the scene where he basically has a conversation with himself by flipping back and forth in the frame to be each individual person in the conversation. It's so stupefyingly dumb, I can't believe they left it in the movie, but it sure drives home the point that Kurt Thomas is a gymnast. In a surprise to absolutely no one other than maybe Kurt Thomas's mom, Thomas's performance was panned pretty heavily in this film. He earned a Razzie nomination for Worst New Actor and never made another feature film after Jim Cotta. But he did do gymnastics commentary for ABC and ESPN later in his career. And frankly, he's a total wiener in this movie. He kind of looks like the love child of Luke Skywalker and MacGyver. Anyway, now that he's finally mastered the art of traversing stairs in a handstand, he's totally ready for the game. But not before he lets Princess Parmesan take a spin on his pommel horse. <laughs> And with all that filler out of the way, it's finally time to get to Parmistan, where we start things by exploring the local salt mines. Yeah, what the fuck, movie? Oh, and we're going to learn that we've been saying Parmistan wrong the whole time. The proper pronunciation is Parmistan. Fancy. But before they can head to Parmistan, they have to kill some time at the local bazaar. This is good, because it looks like Kurt's picking up a new bong. And really, they're in the Kush region, so why not? But while they're haggling over the price, we get another senseless victim of arrow violence when his guide goes down. Clearly, this area of the world needs some bow control reform. Of course, Kurt's not going to stand for this and immediately gives chase, which means finally we can get some Jim Cotta in this goddamn movie. This is literally our first example of how stupid Jim Cotta is as a self-defense system. I mean, Kurt starts flipping around and actually knocks a dude over without touching him. Somewhere, Steven Seagal is nodding in approval. I'm sure Kurt just used his chi or something. But while he's busy doling out some Jim Cotta whoop-ass, the goons have absconded with Princess Parmesan. Pretty sure this movie is just ripping off Super Mario Brothers at this point. The next day, the goons chase him through the streets. He's drastically outnumbered, but as fortune would have it, there's a conveniently placed pull-up bar in this alley. And you know what that means. It's time for more Jim Cotta. And what is a recurring theme in this movie, it's super nice of the goons to run down the alley one at a time in single file so that Kurt can easily kick each one in the face before dealing with the next one. I mean, otherwise they just yank him off that thing and kick the crap out of him, which he probably deserves. With those guys dispatched, Kurt then finds where the princess is being hidden and sneaks in and performs some more poorly choreographed Jim Cotta to save her. I'm not gonna lie, I was kind of expecting the princess to be in another castle. And after an extended chase sequence that isn't very exciting, they finally make it back to their home base. Except, surprise, their handler has double-crossed them. But they're saved by Discount Elliot Gould. Because of course they are. And to be fair, the princess of Parmistan told him not to trust anyone which means his handlers. And technically her, I suppose. With all the subterfuge over, the princess and Kurt row their boat to Parmistan, where they're immediately accosted by ninjas. Which is great, because it means it's time for more Jim Cotta. It's the only thing this movie has going for it, pretty much. The bad news here is that Kurt is totally outnumbered. The even worse news is that there isn't a pommel horse or pull-up bar in sight. Can Jim Cotta overcome the challenge? 
Turns out the answer is no. I mean, who knew that a gymnastics-based self-defense system would be totally useless without a pommel horse around? And shit's about to get even worse for Kurt, because not only did he get his ass kicked, but now he's the guest of Zamir, aka I can't believe it's not Luigi Montefiore. And if you're just listening to this and not watching it on YouTube, you're just gonna have to take my word for it, but Jesus Christ, does the King of Parmesan look like a cross between Mel Brooks and Geraldo Rivera? Anyway, it's finally time to get the game underway which looks a lot like Hard Target as the king turns loose some criminals with a band of ninjas on horses and foot chasing them. I'm not really up on Parmeston customs, but this seems very fair. In a surprise to absolutely no one, the criminals get killed, and now it's time to celebrate. At the castle. In a banquet. Which looks suspiciously like a rowdy night at medieval times. Things are not going swimmingly at this little shindig. First, Kurt learns that his father, Mr. Green Jeans from earlier, was not victorious in the game. Then he learns that Princess Parmeston is getting married tomorrow after the game. And to add insult to injury, she's marrying Zamir. Worst banquet ever. And I guarantee Kurt's gonna have something to say at that speak now or forever hold your peace part of the ceremony. The next day, the real game finally gets underway. And not a moment too soon, because we're well over halfway through this movie by this point. Things get off to a rocky start with Zamir constantly breaking the rules and trying to kill off Kurt Thomas. He doesn't succeed, but he does thin the herd quite a bit. Of course, Zamir is the least of Kurt's worries, because the contestants are turning on each other as well. As an example, he's gonna have to bust out some Gymkata on Thorg, one of his fellow contestants. I love that the movie basically drops this Thorg guy into the action with 1.5 seconds of setup, wherein he basically snubbed Thomas at a meet and greet earlier in the film, and now he's the big villain. Really top-notch writing, guys. Thomas does deal with the Thorg problem, and so you're probably thinking, hey, it's smooth sailing the rest of the way to the win and getting the wish, but not so fast. Shit's about to get worse because Thomas is headed to a place called the Village of the Crazies, which is exactly what it sounds like. I mean, not only is this place full of mentally disturbed people, it's also booby-trapped like a Saw movie, which is kind of cool. Anyway, the Village of the Crazy leads to two of Jim Cotta's most infamous sequences. In the first, Kurt is confronted by a guy with a scythe who conveniently, in the middle of the fight, just randomly lops off his own hand for no good reason. Sure, that totally made sense. Probably just a big Hemingway fan. Honestly, the whole village of the crazies feels like something out of a Silent Hill game or an H.P. Lovecraft novel. It's really pretty cool. There's even a creepy dude with two faces running around here for crying out loud. In another infamous sequence, Kirk finds himself surrounded by crazy villagers. Fortunately, there's also a homemade pommel horse nearby, so he can Jim Cotta the living shit out of these people. Again, it's really nice of the assembled mob to attack him one at a time so that he can spin around and kick each one in the face without getting overwhelmed. I know there are a lot of martial arts out there that deal with fighting group scenarios, but Jim Cotta is clearly at its best when it's one-on-one. -on -one. And there's gymnastics equipment around. Also, these people might be mentally ill, but their manners are impeccable. Truthfully, this whole sequence probably sold the movie at the pitch meeting. Just picture it. It's Kurt Thomas on a pommel horse, waylaying crazy people. I mean, that shit practically sells itself. I mean, had I been in that pitch meeting, I'd have just thrown my wallet and my checkbook at the writer and said, make this happen. After a bunch of random and totally weird slow motion, Kurt is cornered, trapped between a ninja and the crazy villagers. How will Jim Cotta save him now? Ah, uh, wait, it turns out the ninja is none other than his dear old dead dad, who isn't actually dead and is still in Parmeston and now is part of running the game. Again, shit's so obvious Stevie Wonder saw it like four miles over the horizon before it got here. If you're wondering how dad survived dying earlier in the game, well, his explanation makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. He tells Kurt that he fell and the trees broke his fall, except we've seen like four scenes at that rope crossing and there's not a tree in sight. He fell straight onto the rocks. Okay, and this is just more great screenwriting, guys. As it turns out, Dad's return is very short-lived because he gets killed with an arrow. Jesus, there are more guys killed by arrows in this flick than all of the Robin Hood movies combined. After suffering this injustice, Kurt's reached his Popeye point where he's had all he can stand and he can't stand no more. Which immediately leads to a horse chase scene. I mean, really, this movie has it all. And now we can finally get to the showdown we've all been waiting for. Samir Fu versus Jim Cotta. It's like UFC 1. Not gonna lie, things are looking pretty bleak for Jim Cotta in the early going. I mean, Zamir is dishing out pimp hands like Kurt owes him money. But it turns out this is one instance where thick thighs absolutely do not save lives as Kurt chokes him out with his legs. With all that going on, there's a half-assed coup attempt at the castle, but here comes Kurt to save the day. With order restored and the Parmeston line of succession completely safe, he totally ditches his not-dead, severely wounded dad to ride off with Princess Rupali. 
<laughs> what a guy. Then just to add insult to injury, we don't get a conclusion, we get a title card. Kirk got his wish, we build Star Wars, and capitalism wins again. USA! I'm glad the whole premise for Kurt even going to this place was so inconsequential that we could sum it up with a half-assed closing card. That <laughs> really just perfectly sums up Jim Cotta. So now that you have an idea of what Jim Cotta is about, let's talk about the film's enduring legacy. Jim Cotta had a $4 million shooting budget, and I'll be damned if it looks like a $4 million movie. And I don't mean that in a good way. The production was shot in Yugoslavia, and it doesn't have a real A-list cast, so where did all that money go exactly? The film grossed a paltry $5.7 million at the box office, which means it earned more than it cost to make, but that it didn't exactly set the world on fire either. This is probably why we never got Jim Cotta too. Hope springs eternal though. We reboot and remake literally everything these days, so why has there been no updated Jim Cotta? Feels like a missed opportunity. As mentioned earlier, Jim Cotta was the end of Kurt Thomas's leading man in Hollywood career. The film's been the butt of jokes for years, but it's not entirely fair to blame Jim Cotta's failings solely on Kurt Thomas. Sure, he's not even remotely believable as a martial artist, but this movie was doomed from the second they named it. This is one of those instances of concept sounding great on paper, but less so when actually put to film. That being said, Kurt Thomas was an excellent gymnast, and as an actor, he was an excellent gymnast. The film has a terrible 17% rating on Rotten Tomatoes from critics. It does fare slightly better with audiences though, eking out a 40% approval rating from viewers. Flavorwire's Jason Bailey had what is perhaps the best summation of this film experience. This really happened in Hollywood in the 1980s, which gives you some idea of exactly how much cocaine was flowing through that place back then. He is not wrong. But this counterpoint from one of the few positive reviews from the Chicago Reader's Dave Kerr is equally accurate. No real film lover could help but muster some affection for this bedraggled action movie shot in extremely unpicturesque Yugoslavia on a budget that must number in the hundreds of dollars. He is not wrong either. It's not every day that I agree with such diametrically opposing views, but Jim Cotta is not an everyday movie. All in all, it's pretty easy to dismiss Jim Cotta as one of the dumbest movies ever made, but here we are, 40 years later, still talking about it. And that has to say something. It's totally watchable as a train wreck, and I love it for that. And now, it's time to play everyone's favorite new game, Who Would Win in a Fight? As always, we're placing our hero from this movie, Jonathan Cabot, up against legend in his own mind, Steven Seagal. My initial reaction here is that Seagal would mop the floor with Kurt Thomas. Thomas isn't even a real martial artist, and the fight choreography from Zamir actor Richard Norton can't hide that. But the wild card here is that while Jim Cotta is even more useless in real world fighting terms than Seagal's Aikido, I feel like that Kurt Thomas would flip around so much that Seagal would probably get bored and wander off and start telling stories about that time he kicked Bruce Lee's ass. I mean, did that even really happen? I don't know, but it sounds like something Seagal would say. I mean, it's no less outlandish than the other million bullshit lies he's told during his career. Anyway, in this ultimate battle of useless self-defense techniques, I have to give the nod to Seagal. I think he takes Kurt Thomas. I mean, unless there's a pommel horse around, then all bets are off. Hopefully by this point, I've convinced you that you need to see Jim Cotta. This one's available on DVD with no Blu-ray yet, which is absolutely tragic. I mean, I need a full 4K Jim Cotta disc loaded with extras and commentary and behind the scenes footage and all the goodies. This classic certainly deserves that kind of love. Whether you're like me and grew up dying to see this on video after finding it on a video store flyer, or if you've just heard about it on the internet in the intervening decades, this one is well worth tracking down and makes the perfect first film in a triple feature. Which is good, because no one wants a movie night that's only one movie long. And as such, I picked two movies that are the perfect complement to Jim Cotta's martial arts mayhem. The most perfect choice here is obviously the 1980 James Ryan cheese fest, Kill or Be Killed. Ryan is another unlikely action hero sent to a foreign land to take part in a crazy game that involves Nazis and ass kicking. It's every bit as ludicrous as it sounds, but it's a blast. I definitely have a feeling we'll be covering that one at some point too. And a lot of movies for this show. I hope you stick with me. Keeping with the theme of seemingly impractical martial arts like Jim Cotta, you can round out the evening with Jackie Chan's Drunken Master 2. This martial arts classic features Jackie Chan as a total badass who kicks more ass the drunker he gets. And the final showdown with Ken Lo is the stuff of legend. You can't go wrong with either of these movies, and a night that features a triple bill with Killer Be Killed and Drunken Master 2 is going to be unforgettable. Although you'll probably wish you could forget Killer Be Killed. So, what is there even left to say about Jim Cotta? Hell if I know, but let me try to put a bow on this giant shit sandwich because this film definitely deserves that. The key takeaway here is that the 80s really were a magical time for movies. 
Hollywood today is a place where movies are basically made by corporate committee, where test audiences and projections trump creativity and artistic vision. Truth be told, I'd rather sit through a hundred Jim Cottas than watch another $200 million movie based on video games or comic books or some other IP. Side note, does anyone else hear IP and then think of toilet humor? Just me? Fine. The 80s really were a simpler time. A time where studio execs would get together and greenlight a film like Jim Cotta. That Coke reference from earlier really wasn't far off. You really have to wonder how this thing even got made, and if anyone got fired for it afterwards. These movies might have been weird and cheap and nonsensical and all the other negative adjectives you can toss at them, but they're also incredibly charming and driven by a sort of misguided belief that they were making something great. Jim Cotta is not great. In fact, if 10-year-old me had seen Jim Cotta back in the early 1980s, it would have probably taught me an important lesson about judging things by the cover or the poster art or the box. Nah, who am I kidding? 10 or 11-year-old me would have eaten this shit up. This would have been my favorite movie until Revenge of the Ninja came out. It's got a dude fighting ninjas on a pommel horse. I mean, that shit sells itself. Anyway, the point here is the same as it always is. Filmmakers and studios were a lot more daring back in the 1980s. They made films that were outlandish and ridiculous, because executives and studios were just willing to take more risks. As is the case with many of these films, those risks didn't exactly pay off in great cinema, but I'd much rather spend my days debating the merits of a martial arts system like Jim Cotta than speculating on the next wave of Marvel movies. Spoiler alert, they're just like the previous waves. They really just don't make movies like this anymore, so thank God for DVD and Blu-ray so that we all can experience this kind of magic. What do you think of Jim Cotta? Leave me a comment and let me know. I may feature some of the comments on a future episode of this podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, please be sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening on another podcasting platform, please consider leaving me a review. It helps the show grow. Oh, and be sure to share with your friends. Because sharing is caring. Until next time, you've been listening to B-Movie Babylon. I'm Mike Bracken. The video vault is now closed. Thank you.